Can you count, suckers? On to uh, on to the next speaker we have for you. So uh, we are very excited for uh, with with Dean's presentation. Truly exciting times when it comes to the consumer journey. But I don't know about you guys, man. I'm scared as hell as uh, as a technology provider trying to figure this out. But we've got a big team, and obviously today will move us to the right step. No one step closer. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Ernest Kim, Strategic Planning Director for uh, XM Asia Pacific, up to the stage. A big round of applause. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Ernest. Thanks. So, um, just for some of your information, Ernest uh, was most recently, I think, relocated to Singapore this year only, right? Yeah. And prior to this, he was with uh, Whedon and Kennedy in the States. Yes. And uh, we're very excited to have him here today because he just came off fresh from a Khan's Go Lion Award win for the job, the Khan's Go Lion Award for some of the work that he has done. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to let Ernest uh, take you guys through to what he has for us today. Thanks a lot. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I've kept the slides pretty brief, so hopefully there'll be, I was hoping we'd have an opportunity to have a little bit of a Q&A afterwards, so the presentation itself is pretty short. The uh, fuel band thing was interesting actually in that uh, prior to working at Widen, I actually did work at Nike as a product manager for about four years during the time when Nike Plus first launched, so if you guys have any questions about that, I'd be happy to talk about that as well, but I was going to share with you primarily something uh, I worked on while I was at Widen, where I worked on the Coke account. So. Oh, sorry, so this is me, um, and anybody who's a Twitter fan, if you feel like tweeting, if you want to use this hashtag, then it'll make it easy for me to go check afterwards and see what you said and see how much you thought it was boring or interesting. <laughs> so if you want to use a hashtag, please uh, use that one. Uh, as the title said, I was going to be focusing on creativity and the use of data in terms of fueling impactful creative. And so I thought, what better way to start than with this slide of Orson Welles? amazing creative talent. Uh, but the reason I wanted to start with him was this quote where he talks about the enemy of art being the absence of limitation. And I think this is an interesting one because it's kind of counterintuitive. I think a lot of times when people talk about creativity, they talk about, oh, you need no limits, you know, blue sky thinking, limitless, blah, blah, blah. But I think anyone who's been in our industry, I think a lot of people who've been in the creative world recognize that that's probably the most difficult situation of all. You, typically, if you want to do good work, you need some constraints, some parameters to work around. And in our industry, that takes the form today in, in the form of a brief. And what informs that brief is data. And so that's something that's not new. I think it's interesting that you know, everybody in the marketing world is so crazy about data, but it's certainly not something that's new to our field. You know, anytime uh, a client would have come to an agency, with a problem, the first thing, you know, back in the day, the account manager would have done was to go do some research. Oh, well, after that, sorry, uh, I don't know how I got that, I got in there, but do some research. This is actually from the archives of JWT in London. Um, just some of the, the historical documentation that they would have kept. It's now in the uh, Historical Advertising Trust, also in London. But you would have started with some desktop research, also likely would have done some primary research, perhaps in the form of focus groups. This is actually something from Mad Men, but I think it's probably something that's familiar to a lot of us. And all of that information would have 
been taken together and informed a brief that would then hopefully lead to some impactful work. What happened though, um, if you look back at the history of advertising a bit, what happened was over time, this worked pretty well, but over time, as often happens, this practice of research went from being a means to an end to an end in, of, in and of itself. And so you had the situation where you had all these different ways that people wanted to measure advertising and the effectiveness of advertising. And if you look at people, uh, what people were saying back in those days, it ended up leading to almost paralysis by analysis because you'd have all these different data points, oftentimes conflicting, and what would happen is you'd end up getting the most conservative, boring work possible because there was no way to make sense of this data. And some of the leading people in their industry recognize this. This is a quote from Stanley Pollitt, who's uh, widely recognized as having basically invented the field of account planning. And he's talking about this, th these research techniques that existed during the 70s and basically saying what was happening was that people were just doing research for the sake of research and every, people were just cherry picking the bits that were interesting to them and saying, okay, this is why you, creative person, have to change your work. And it ended up, you ended up having this really awful work, basically. I think it's probably something that's familiar to a lot of us today as well. But this was something that was a, a, a huge issue back in the 60s. And it also contributed to this, which is my favorite quote of all, related to advertising, which is this Ogilvy quote. I think this one's good enough to just read, which is where he said, I notice an increasing reluctance on the part of marketing executives to use, to use judgment. They're coming to rely too much on research, and they use it as a drunkard uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. And this was something that was handcuffing creatives in particular, because there was no way to do effective work when everybody was just cherry picking the data that thought supported their point of view. So what happened was that this role of account planning was invented, and not that we were the panacea, but the, the intent was to create almost a, a somewhat more objective third party, whereas previously the research was done by the account manager, now you had this uh, additional party that was focused on the research and was also intended to be a conduit to creative because you know there was the recognition that ultimately creatives need to get this data in some form that's useful to them so they can create great work right so this worked pretty well for a while but you know as we've seen recently now we've got credible proliferation of data Right? We've got all these data sources. It's starting to seem a little bit familiar. This is actually a slide from, uh, I should give credit to a guy. I won't even try to pronounce his last name, but his first name is Vinny. He worked at Google in this region for a long time um, as an analytics consultant. He's a really, really smart guy in the analytics space. And these are actually a couple of slides that he put together for a presentation he gives as well. So hopefully you won't mind that I crib his slides. But so we've got this incredible sea of data. Um, and we've also got a similar situation in that we're oftentimes cherry-picking the data that seems most appealing to us and oftentimes doesn't really have a lot to do with the end goal. So it's, it's almost a situation of what's old is new again, we're, we're, or deja vu all over again. We're, we're inundated with all this data, we don't know what to do, so we kind of pick and choose the stuff we like, and then we end up with mediocre work because it's not honest, it's not based on honest insights. Um, this was another interesting thing that he talks about, which is that Everybody loves to talk about data nowadays. You know, it's the thing that everybody wants to talk about. And when he goes around the region and talks to marketers about data, you know, the easy thing, they all check off the list, which is that they're collecting data. But on the things that, that actually have an impact, would have an impact on their business, they're not, they're not actually delivering. They're not uh, assigning anybody to actually look at that data or try to glean insights from that data. So we're in a very similar situation, I think, as we were in the 60s, where we have a lot of data coming in, but we're not using it very effectively. So, and you know, I wanted to bring up this example as well. This is a guy named Nate Silver. And after the election that happened in the US, the week after that happened, the people the person that people in Washington were talking about most was not Obama or Romney, it was this guy Nate Silver, because he correctly predicted the outcome of the election months in advance, also the margin, and got the outcome in every single state correct. So people were amazed by this, and they called him now the king of the quants. But even he talks about the limitations of data. This is something he's mentioned in an uh, interview with The Guardian. So, you know, having more information doesn't necessarily make us better at predicting what's going to happen. It's 
what you're able to do, the insights that you're able to glean from that information. So I think it's exciting to see that even people who are now on the leading edge of the data space are talking about this. That it's not just about collecting data, it's about getting things that are of value. And if we're talking about creative, I think there's some very specific things that we can pull out of that data. And I'll, I'll take you through an example. So if, if it's not just about quantity, then what is it? So this is another guy who's done pretty good business based on data is Jeff Bezos, who's the CEO of Amazon.com. And he talks about the importance of focusing on the things that don't change. Because, and again, I think this might seem counterintuitive because of the space he's in, the space we're all in, which is digital, everything's changing so fast. We feel like we always need to be on top of everything that's happening the second it happens. But his point of view is that those things are changing so quickly that if you build your strategies around them, by the time you implement them, they'll have changed. And so your strategy won't be valid anymore. So instead, focus on the fundamental things that don't change, the things that your customers are, are going to care about. So in the case of Amazon, he says, for example, he knows my customers aren't going to suddenly want less selection or want slower shipping. You know, those are things that aren't going to change. So those are the things that he builds his strategies around. So, you know, what does this have to do with advertising and in particular creative advertising? I wanted to just share this example for you. This is something I worked on, uh, as was mentioned while I was at Wine and Kennedy. It was for Coke. And it was around an event called the Super Bowl. I know football, American football is not big here, but in the U.S. it's a really big deal. And the Super Bowl is the biggest media event of the year. So um, it's a huge event for uh, marketers as well. I think 30 seconds is... 30 seconds of airtime is something like 2.5 million US dollars or something like that. So it's, a, it's an incredible venue. And every year, Coke uses the Super Bowl as a platform for communications. And this year, they came to us with a very simple challenge, which was there were two, just two components to it. One was they wanted to bring back the polar bears. So again, I don't think it's something that's done very much here, but in the US and in some other regions, Coke uses polar bears as part of their advertising, uh, particularly in, around the holiday season, so polar bears and uh, Santa. Uh, so they wanted to bring the polar bears back to, to uh, the national stage. And they also said they wanted to become part of the cultural conversation again. So that was essentially the brief. And what we, we took that in and basically ended up with this piece of work that I'll show you right now. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. When Coca-Cola asked us to bring back the polar bears for this year's Super Bowl, the agency knew it would be a challenge. Cute bears and football don't necessarily go together. Unless they're part of an unprecedented campaign. The first to fully integrate football, polar bears, and how viewers consume media in and around the biggest sporting event on Earth. It started with a digital idea that cast the polar bears as football fans. One rooting for the Patriots, one for the Giants. Then invited America to watch the Bears watch the game live. As the game was played, we puppeted the Polar Bears, making them react to everything that happened in real time. Looking and has time, and then throws, and that is caught for a touchdown by Woodhead. Eli throwing into traffic on the sideline, and a rule to catch by Manningham. Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, Stan the Bears even reacted to the advertising. It's halftime America, and our second half's about to begin. All right. Falling asleep there. The, the, uh, the entire campaign generated enormous chatter. Twitter and Facebook lit up with over 5,000 comments per minute. And despite not having thumbs, the polar bears responded to fans in real time. Fans who were watching the Bears watch the game on over 9 million screens and watching for an average of 28 minutes per screen. That's a really long commercial. That's also a lot of eyeballs. When the television aired, the spots were synced with our digital stream and also reacted to the game. Multiple versions were produced and aired based on how the game was going. After the Super Bowl, publications looking beyond traditional advertising ranked the campaign as a first, carving out a new space for digital, real-time advertising. Not bad for a webcam from the Arctic. So this was something that was um, definitely a challenge. Oh. Okay, this is actually the... Um, timeline that we had put together just for the, the 
two weeks, basically, of the kind of primary activation window. Uh, it involved a lot of collaboration between a lot of different agencies. Widen was the lead creative agency. In our case, Starcom Media Vest was the media agency. I'm sorry, Widen was the lead creative agency. Starcom Media Vest was the lead media agency. Um, there are lots of new technologies involved, like the puppeting the bears in real time that had never been used before. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, there were many, many touch points. There was the TV ads, there was the digital experience that was live, there was uh, banner units as well. You could actually watch the live stream in banner units, mobile, SMS, etc. It was lots of moving parts. Um, and in addition to the quantitative results that we got, what we were really excited about was some of the qualitative, and you can't read this, unfortunately, it's too small, but these were examples of some of the tweets that were generated. Some of the, I think, uh, Hootsuite documented it at something like 65,000 tweets about this campaign in the four-hour window of the game, which was the most of any campaign. And so this is just a sampling of some of them, and we're really excited to see that people were welcoming Coke into their game day experience, which is exactly the result we were looking for. You have quotes of people talking about the polar bears being better than the game itself. Another person said, I wish the bears could just react to everything that happened in my life every day because it's so cool, blah, blah, blah. So this was really exciting to see. Um, and then, you know, it was also exciting to see that in terms of our industry peers, we also got some nice recognition. But um, having worked on this, you know, you might think, oh, was the, the, what made it so exciting and impactful was all the whiz-bang stuff. But really, having led the digital strategy on this for almost a year, I can say definitely that I think, you know, those things contributed, but what really made it impactful was that we did focus on the fundamental things, the things that don't change. And that was that people were social, you know, we're social animals. We want to have social experiences. We want to do storytelling in a social context, like you know, people telling a story around the fire. This doesn't happen anymore today because we don't live like this, but that doesn't mean that we've changed. That inherent desire to be social and to tell stories in a social context hasn't changed. So that was that fundamental thing that we hung our hats on. And the one data point that probably helped us the most was this, which was something from Nielsen. From, actually, it was from 2009, at the, because we were starting right around February, March of uh, 2011 for, for this campaign, which launched in 2012. So this was the most recent data we had around second screen or social TV type behavior. And this, what this told us was that people were doing this. That, you know, because the population is fragmented, people don't live together as families anymore, they still want that experience. So the way they're getting that social storytelling, social um, viewing experience is through digital mediums. So, you know, like Dean mentioned, they're doing a lot of different things, but as they're watching TV, they're also looking at their digital devices. So this told us that there was this opportunity, and this was basically the core of the brief to the creative team, saying, you know, in addition to the things that Coke wanted around bringing the polar bears back, being part of the uh, cultural conversation, it was this, basically this inside, this data point, to say that people, you know, we know people want to share, and this is how they're doing it today. And then, you know, amazing as they are, they came up with this idea of, hey, what if the polar bears are watching the game at the same time as you and you could talk to them via Twitter? And that led to this whole incredible thing. But, you know, instead of just inundating them with all kinds of different data about viewing habits, which we all had, you know, of course, obviously, as a planning group, we collected all that data. But then in terms of what we shared with the creative team, something that they could digest and work with, it was basically this. Um, just one more thing I wanted to talk about, because so far all I've talked about has been on the agency side. But this absolutely couldn't have happened without Coke uh, believing in this, because this was the first time, as far as I know, that they actually ended up spending more on production of their digital execution than they did on the TV. Obviously, on the you know, media side, they spent more on the TV. But uh, in terms of production, digital was the biggest. And actually, the idea was digital first, because it came from this notion of watching the bears watch the game. And that was what the TV spots were about as well. So the only way we could have done so, I mean, I, thinking back on it, I'm almost shocked that Coke was willing to do it, because it's crazy. Like, who would do this? I mean, because you, you've got this huge risk of millions of dollars in TV spend, so why would you want to do this incredibly risky thing in digital as well? And it's because they had this culture. This is a great quote from a management consultant guru, Peter Drucker, talking about culture eating strategy for breakfast. And it's absolutely true, because we could have come up with the best plan possible, but if Coke didn't have a culture that was interested in innovating, but also interested in driving conversations, it never, never would have happened. 
Um, and this was really exciting. What kind of gave us hope was this piece written by Koch CMO, actually, not long before we started ideating around this campaign, where he talked about the shift within, within Koch away from a focus on impressions and to a focus on what they call expressions, or just getting people to talk about the brand, earning that right to be a part of consumers' conversations, day-to-day -day conversations. So their CMO made this a priority. He said, we're not just going to be about impressions anymore. It's going to be about getting people to talk about our brand because we think that's the best way to get to make sure that we, we're top of mind when they're buying a soft drink, essentially. So without this culture in place of focusing on consumer expressions on the client side, that definitely wouldn't have happened. I don't know if there's any clients here, but this was kind of my hope was if there were any clients here to say, hey, uh, we need support on the client side as well. And, and there was definitely um, uh, some hesitation, but because this was in place from the very top of the marketing organization within Coke, we were able to bring this idea to life. Otherwise, it just never would have happened. And then, you know, in terms of results and things you can measure, I think it's exciting to see that Coke is the line in green, Pepsi is the line in blue, that roughly around the same time that they went public with this new approach, you can see that they started to really see a lot of differentiation in terms of their stock results as compared to Pepsi. So it's not just something that results in nice case studies, it's been also great, good business for Coke. So I think for a lot of reasons, this was something that was really exciting to us. So just to leave you with two learnings from this experience. First, to, you know, let's go back to looking at data as a means to an end rather than an end in and of itself. And it, from a working with creatives point of view, the end for us is to state the problem in uh, a way that's going to be inspiring to the creative team. So not to give solutions, not to give answers, but to really clearly state that problem, what it is we're trying to do. And then finally, you know, as I mentioned, it's so easy to get seduced by the new, get seduced by all this uh, new platforms, new data, etc. But I think the the best way to achieve success and impact is to look at those things that don't change, look at those fundamentals and focus on those. And, you know, obviously there'll be elements of the way you express something, the way it comes to life that you do want to use new platforms for, but for the core of that big idea, I think you're, you'll be best served by looking at those things that don't change. So that's it. Uh, hopefully people will have some questions. I know typically when I do stuff in Singapore. People don't really have questions very often. <laughs> okay. That's a really good question. You know, I, I didn't mention it, but the ads, the broadcasts were definitely a big part of it. But because Coke is not an official sponsor of the league, of the football league, we weren't allowed to include the URL in these spots. So the spots just ended with Coca-Cola, you know, uh, unlock happiness or you know, something like that, just the generic tagline. It was a huge, you can't even imagine the stress we went through about that because the NFL approved the ads with the URL and then two weeks before they said no, so it was incredible. But so it was an exciting experiment to see, will we still get lift from these spots when they don't have that call to action to go to the site? And Looking at the data, we actually we saw a bit of a bump, but not much. Um, a lot of the engagement actually started at the front end of the game before the ads had even run. And it was a product, we think, of a lot of the digital media we had done. We did, I mean, there was a lot that SMG had done in terms of paid digital, but we also did a lot of earned. I mean, fortunately, Coke has one of the biggest Facebook presences uh, in the world. So you know, that was very helpful to be able to use that audience. But um, because we weren't able to use the URL in the spots, they actually didn't give us that much lift in terms of uh, engagement with the site. But it's a good question. We were really worried about that. So it's exciting that even without that, we still got that level of engagement that we were able to achieve. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Is it something that's going to live on beyond that execution is that is, oh, there, is it die now? I can't. I mean, I can't speak to that. Not, you know, I don't know what Coke's plans are at this point. I know though that they do own the technology. That was part of the whole relationship. Um, the technology was developed for them, and so if they want to, they definitely can use it 
again, and they could replace the bears with other characters as well. So it is something that could potentially be used um, for other uh, types of sports or in other markets. We have time for one last question. Anyone want to... How about a hard question? Like, say you don't agree. <laughs> so I've got, a, I've got the final question for you, Ryan. Sure. So what makes you decide to uh, relocate to Singapore since you're doing such uh, exciting <laughs> stuff back in the States? That's a good question. Um, I have to say the answer is a little bit corny, but uh, I, you know, I did love being at Wyden. Uh, the team was fantastic, and it, you know, if, I can't think of any other place I'd want to work in the U.S. in, in advertising. But uh, what sparked it was when Steve Jobs passed away, actually. And I went back and rewatched his, I don't know if, how many people have seen his Stanford commencement speech he gave at their graduation, and he talked about, basically, he talked a lot about death, and essentially talked about doing um, what makes you happy and uh, living life in the moment, living life now. And that made me think, you know, I'm not getting any younger and I was interested in Asia and all the things that were happening in Asia. So I thought, hey, I should do this while I can still enjoy it. Um, and so I was thinking that and then just as that was happening in my head, uh, a recruiter from Singapore contacted me. So I thought, oh, it's meant to be, I should do this. So that's what, that's what led to it. <laughs> Thank you very much. A big round of applause Thanks. for Ernest. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.